Hey, everybody, it's your girl, Charlotte Van Horn with Black Expats in Panama. You know, we founded our Facebook group last year and it's just growing and developing and everybody wants to connect with our other Afro-Panamanians and see the things that we need to learn to be conscious um, residents of Panama when we, when we get there and just to be knowledgeable about the things that are going on. Um, there was this name that kept coming up, uh, <laughs> Melvin Brown. And Melvin is an attorney and a consultant in sustainable development. Um, he's doing a lot of things in the community and making an impact on the world, uh, really. And we just wanted to have him on, allow him to introduce himself and tell us more about, you know, what you're doing. So welcome, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so glad to have you, and uh, I'm honored to have you, and I, and I have to tell you, this is our first time actually uh, meeting, but That's I do have to tell you that, um, you know, I'm very particular about my guests, and people say wonderful things about you, and so I definitely am honored to be able to um, talk with you today. So just tell us a little bit about who you are and what you've been up to. Well, thank you very much uh, to all your viewers and followers. Uh, I am Melvin Brown. I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm also a consultant in sustainable development. That means that I design and implement master plans, strategic plans, program and projects that are part of master planning work. I also do design processes, development processes. I um, my father, Victor, uh, run a furniture store and my mother was a hair stylist. I have, uh, we are four, uh, three brothers and a sister, my Dora. She was uh, for many years into healthcare for the elderly. Mm -hmm. uh, Victor, the eldest of the, of the boys, he's an attorney. Uh, Tony, he is a electronic engineer. And um, yes, he's also a, a pastor. And um, I graduated from the University of Panama with a law degree uh, in law and political science. Mm -hmm. uh, 26 years ago, um, when I traveled around the country and also when I started to travel abroad, I noticed that uh, black people um, were living in conditions that were different from other people who were recessive. So um, I, started, I decided to research and what kind of condition made us to be living um, in the places that we were living under the, that, those conditions. And after researching uh, scholarly works and uh, people who have a lot of academic background in anthropology and history, I came upon Ivan Van Sertima's work. They came before Columbus. Um, I read uh, She Entered the Up work. And I found that Walter Williams was very... Um, helpful in understanding where we were in antiquity and what colonialism meant to our present state uh, where we are at this time. Uh, as you know, uh, according to Walter Williams, uh, our ancestors were the, not only the fact that uh, humanity started in Africa, but we were actually the beginners and starters of civilizations, not only the Nile Valley civilization, but civilization like um, Great Zimbabwe, um, civilization like um, uh, the Olmecas in the Americas. So uh, black people for thousands and thousands of years were uh, civilization builders. Mm -hmm. But then came, then came colonialism. Mm -hmm. And with colonialism uh, came bondage and destruction of our culture and destruction of our civilization. 
um, when Alexander the Greek entered Egypt in 332 before the Common Era, he found himself with an advanced uh, people who were able to do marvelous things like build pyramids and so forth. And we actually didn't know that there were reception people in other parts of the world because it was unknown to us. Right. And uh, reading Sheikh Antadi up, I realized that when the group of Africans uh, went beyond uh, the uh, got trapped in the ice age in the in the in European mountains, they passed a lot of time isolated, and they lost their identity, and they also lost their pigmentation. Mm. And when the when the when the the warming of those areas came about, the survivors then uh, came and formed different tribes and eventually nations. And these are the people which were, they were, they call them warrior tribes. Some people call them barbarians. There are different names for them. Mm -hmm. When these people came about the Egypt and they saw this great advanced civilization, then there was a, uh, there was a confrontation between two civil, two type of people. One that were ostracized and that they were deprived for a long period of time of all kind of basic um, necessities, come necessities and, and, and accommodations mm -hmm. uh, because they had to go into the caverns. And on uh, the other hand, we had people. They had people who were um, rich and that they were comfortable, that they were knowledgeable, they were, they had, uh, in the case of the Nile Valley civilization, they had two different, uh, three different alphabets. They were, they're mapping stars, building pyramids, building exotic temples. They were, they, they were rich in gold. Uh, they had all kind of advanced concept of, of uh, medicine and whatever. Mm -hmm. Everything that you can think about in terms of civilized advanced people or was or we had it mm -hmm. so when they had that conflict um that conflict has lasted until today between these two groups of people um we already know that officially uh we have two systems that has oppressed melanin rich people in the last 600 years we have colonialism for 450 years, and now we have neo-colonialism for the last 150 years. Even though there are still colonies, but in terms of the bulk of the organized way of uh, establishing uh, communities, nations, nation states, those are the, the, the two big periods that we, that we find ourselves. So actually our condition was not on, always this way. We were uh, exceptionally um, well-groomed, uh, intellectual-type uh, people. Also, we were also warriors, but we were very inclined to, to the intellect. Mm -hmm. um, but colonialism and neo-colonialism have been devastating for us. And not only that has been devastating from the point of view of human rights violation, but in terms of our economy, because the transfer of our treasures and our riches to the colonial um, administration uh, have left us in a situation where now they call us that we are poor, that we are poor. But we mm -hmm. were always rich before this condition was created. So my my um, mindset is anytime I find a problem is what to do. Okay. So I started to learn about sustainable development. Okay. And by learning about sustainable development, I realized that you can't have sustainable development without a process. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and worked with a group and we did a process called a process for sustainable social and economic sustainable development for people of African descent. That's the name of the process. Okay. And we designed a master plan for Colón. And it's called uh, the- For Re Colón? Yeah, Colón City. Uh-huh. It's called the Regional Master Plan 
for Western Columbia. Okay. And, and the, the, the chief- when, when was that established? That was in the 1995, 96. Uh, we, we, we did that work. We, we, as a matter of fact, we designed several plans, but that plan was the one that I participated directly. Okay. And the, the chief economist that was drilling and teaching us about this concept about master planning was uh, Dr. Stewart from New York. And um, after we did that and they decided not to give us the opportunity to implement our ideas, I decided to further my studies. I went to Durban. I participated in uh, ONECA, which is a Central America uh, uh, organization. And I, when I came back from Durban, I started to write a master plan for people of African descent. And in 2003, uh, we had a meeting of uh, professional, intellectual, community activists, leaders, and we agreed upon to implement this process. So we did, we had a conceptual master plan and we had a political platform. Okay, so let me ask you this. Okay, so, so when, I guess you didn't get the funding and support for the sustainable plan for Cologne? We did, we had the funding, we had the bank letters, everything was okay, but uh, we had competitors. On the east side of Cologne, there is a group, uh, had a, there's a project called uh, Cologne 2000. Okay. And our competitors decide to use political clout to avoid us from implementing that plan. So what they did is there is, each time we do a plan, there's what we call a mega project. And we say that anytime you develop a plan, you need to have a project that is big enough to make the plan work. Because if the plan doesn't have a project that's big enough to make it work, then the plan is not going to be um, implementable because yes. it, it can't sustain itself if it don't have an economic boost. And we designed within the plan a project called La Playita. And it was, it had five-star hotel, three-star hotel, a museum, a theme park. Uh, and it was, since it was in a fisherman area, we call it the Playita project. Um, and um, that project was worth on paper $100 million. So it wasn't no small uh, plan. And our competitors were able to get the government to deny us the opportunity to participate in implementing the project. So what they did is they took the plan and start to implement it little by little over the years, bits by bits, not to uh, confront a legal battle with us. Um, so it, it started to, uh, components of the plan started to appear, not only in, in Cologne, but in, also in Panama and different parts, but without saying where the ideas came from. So uh, being the kind of uh, personality that I have, I decided to go further, deeper into the study of this whole concept of master planning and, uh, and, and concept development. So by doing that, when I came back from Durban, um, we got together a group of four of us and we decided to call the, 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 the communities and leaders and present them with this um, new concept of development. And the community was, and leaders in Cologne? In national, okay. we had a national meeting and about 24 organizations responded. And we met and agreed to implement this process. By doing so, um, now I will, I'm, I'm being told that officially um, the plan is going to be uh, um, uh, backed by this administration. And I also understand 
that there is a willingness for us to continue doing different development work in terms of concepts. Melvin, that is good news. Exactly right. Very that good. That is so good news. Right. And I'm glad that you spoke about Cologne because. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that we want to do as Black expats is to talk about cologne because only thing you hear about cologne <laughs> is negative, okay? And, and coming from the States, um, it's almost the same concept and the way that things happen here. For example, um, in Washington, D.C., there is this area called Southeast, okay? And the only thing forever and ever that you heard is that you want to avoid the Southeast. The Southeast is almost like they make it like where our people are as boogeymen. Like you want to, you want to, you want to stay away from there. That is the message that gets from Panama to at least I know the United States about Cologne. And I don't like that because I know that we're not getting the whole story. I know that there are things that can be done. I know the systemic racism um, and disparities that occur here, occur there. And what happens is for example, in DC, when the white people ran out of places to live in the city, guess what? Regentrification happened. You know, now all of a sudden DC has got the funds and has got the support and has got the, the, the maintenance um, in, in Southeast DC. So I'm just saying that I'm glad to hear, um, you know, what you're doing and that, and that we will definitely be keeping an eye on that. And when we're coming to, and I hope that we can get together in May because we're bringing two groups of 60 people to Panama in May, and it's it's we're coming during Etnia Negra, and um, we want to, like I said, we want to focus on the Black culture and the things that are wrong, and some things that we can do as residents of Panama to assist in your progress forward. So, what are kind of some of the things that you know people coming in could help you with you and the organizations that you're working with? Okay, one, uh, Dr. Luis George Singh, which is the Prime Minister of the State of the African Diaspora, has given me the opportunity to be, uh, to be a member of Parliament of the, this new state that is being organized since 2018, July 2018, July 1st. And after I requested that Panama had a, have a new regional office because of the fact that in the Americas there are 200 million uh, people of African descent. And um, out of that, there's close to 150 million people between the Caribbean, Central America, and South America. So he accepted. So now Panama has four MPs, four members of parliament. I'm one. Hilma Camargo is one. Samuel Samuel and, and um, Urena Best are the other three. Yes. And we had now, Urena was on the show. Right, mm -hmm. right. And now we have a regional office, which uh, we are promoting uh, the state of the African diaspora because in the diaspora as a whole, in other words, outside of continental Africa, you have close to 350 million people of African descent. And um, in 2018, uh, the prime minister, Dr. Thing got the, uh, was commissioned to organize uh, this, group of, of, uh, of persons, of melanin-rich people, mestizo people of African descent. And that's the reason why he decided to get a group of uh, professionals together, make a constitution, make a, a executive branch, organize an executive branch, organize a parliament. And that's how we came about to bring us to the point where now we want to have a, a, a leadership uh, election where the MPs or members of parliament elect their leadership so we can actually uh, get all our work organized, laws, regulations that need to be passed. And that's what we're going to do in December first. And then in three years time, we are going to have a general election where all positions would have to be uh, voted. Uh, there'll be a democratic process to elect all officials. So, but this time around, 
it will be a uh, uh, election of leadership by uh, MP, by members of parliament. Okay. And you're running for vice president, correct? Of Central America and the Caribbean. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for sharing that. So in addition to that, um, you've been very active during um, um, the pandemic. Um, helping people in Panama. Can you tell us about some of the work that you're doing there and the group that well, you're doing? I, cho I chose to, to put my office in the community because I felt that, um, that people of African descent need to have someone in the community who was the bilingual that could serve uh, to help them with whatever legal issues they may have. Mm -hmm. And since I, this, since I was working with this concept of sustainable development, community development, master planning. I felt that if I had an office outside of the community, it wouldn't fit because if you're talking about community development, then you need to have a presence, a physical presence. Boots the on the ground. Right, on the ground. Yes. And um, uh, so, we, so we did that. And then I started to say, well, in the process, how can we start getting institutional work done? So it occurred to me after talking to Dr. Tin and other people that I should start doing some specific things based on the components of the process. Mm -hmm. So the process speaks about capacity building. So I decided to put together a center called Shabaka mm -hmm. because Shabaka was a prominent pharaoh who did a lot of, 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 of good and he had a, a, a clear vision in terms of spirituality and we are very spiritual people. So I, yes. I, I picked Shabaka because of what he, his legacy. So we yes. have a Shabaka center for capacity building so that we can teach people about master planning, strategic planning, project and program. And we can also re do research and development to let people know that our history did not start with colonialism. A lot of times when they talk about our history, they start to speak about colonialism. Mm -hmm. and, um, slavery. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. in, in slavery. Mm -hmm. But our history uh, goes back tens of thousands of years of civilized activity. I'm not talking about the beginning of humanity. I'm talking about civilized activity. And um, according to Walter Williams, there's 10,000 uh, years of documented civilized activity by melanin rich people before the common era. So um, somebody has to let people know about this because um, I don't want the next generation to feel that their history began with colonialism. That's not true. So your, your office in Re is in Ria Bajo? Parque de Febre. Parque de Febre, okay. Parque de Febre. Parque de Febre, yes. la Febre. Right. My, my Spanish is not too good looking. Uh, <laughs> don't worry I'm about it. Trying. it I'm trying. I am trying. But you know. It's also a, sweet. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, as actually, Alfredo said to tell you that um, Alejandro and Angelo Gibbs said yeah. to tell you hello. Because you know, my, my husband grew up in Parque Le Febre. Right, nice street. Gives, and so they are aware of, uh, of you at all. Now, when you talk about, okay, I'm just going to say this like, when you talk about the, the master planning and the strategic planning, um, and when you say you're, when you're saying you're a consultant of sustainable development, the way that that is termed is not really that familiar to me as like, I don't hear that a lot in the United States. And so I right. just want to make sure that we understand, you know, exactly what you do. So let me see if, I, if I'm getting it right. Sustainable development basically means that, you know, you want to work to implement changes that will um, cause uh, people and communities to grow and to be able to continue to sustain the development and growth. That's correct. You can have development without master planning work, 
but you can have sustainable development without master planning work, meaning that you can have an initiative of a, a, a people or a group or a corporation or a local government or national government and there's development. But if you want the development to be sustainable, then you need to have master and strategic planning. In other words, you need to have a blueprint. You need yes. to have, um, if, you, if, if you start a house without a blueprint, you may be able to get put some kind of structure together, but since it doesn't have a blueprint, chances are that it may not last too long, or if it lasts, if the, the rain falls too hard, or there's an earthquake, there are a lot of chances that it will collapse. But if you have a blueprint, and if you have some planning work, uh, chances are that you'll have a proper foundation, that you'll have the proper structure to make it last. So what we do is, uh, or what I've been doing is specializing in blueprints development blueprints and the blueprint is the process and out of the process come the master planning strategic planning program and project so that's what we've been doing we're specializing and studying different blueprints that we can apply to different realities and make people go from point a to point b and from point b to point c in an orderly manner or like if you if you build something you need to have a maintenance plan for it because if you just build it and leave it then it's not sustainable because you have to like if you build a, a building you build a house and you never you know um you never check the heating system or you never paint the house or you never fix the roof when it goes bad. And that's, that's, you're building something that is not sustainable. It sounds like I need you in my life. <laughs> it really does. And thank you for breaking that down to me. And you know, the one thing that I'm never too proud to do is say, I don't completely understand. You know what I'm saying? Because to have the the, the, the benefit and the blessing to be able to have a conversation with somebody clearly as amazing and intelligent as yourself and to walk away still confused is a disservice <laughs> to me and to everybody else like me that may have been one doing the same thing, right? Right. <laughs> they say the only dumb question is the one you didn't ask. That's correct. Uh, I, 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 and, and you know that um, even though we call it a name like master planning and strategic planning. Actually, in our community, we had people who understood the concept because, for example, um, we had teachers like Teacher Philip that they will, they will run the school. So even though um, there were restrictions to, for English-speaking kids in the regular school system until the barrier was broken down, that we had a system, we had a school system, we had people that taught us. Yeah. And my father used to build the furniture. So if you need a furniture, you come to Mr. Brown. If you uh, need to fix your car, we have mechanic shops. Um, if you needed a land, you will go to Mr. Piggott. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Piggott will tell you, well, we have available a lot in Rio Bajo, Pueblo Nuevo, Juan Diaz. And then men that uh, on the weekend, uh, you will have the men that work in the canal, they will get themselves together, plumbers and electricians and, and, uh, and, um, and um, mason workers, and they will build their homes. So you have like Pueblo Nuevo, Rio Bajo, mm -hmm. they were built and in an orderly manner. In other words, yes. there are houses that were built from the canal day that are still uh, up and functional today as we speak. Wow. So, so we, what I'm trying to say is that in our Caribbean culture, they understood planning because, mm -hmm. because I'm the product of a plan because 
where the office is at, my grandmother purchased the land and they built it. My uncle was one of the builders in the community and he built it. Wow. So, so they, they understood the concept of planning. They, have, they understood it perfectly. Yeah. So, okay, so where are your people from? Uh, uh, Jamaica and Barbados. Okay, so the same as my father in love. His, my, um, my mother in love is, is um, Hazel Van Horn, and her people were from Jamaica. They came to build the canal. And my father in love is Alfredo Gibbs, and his people was from Barbados. And That's so, right. and, and, I'm, and I'm letting people see, you know, because I don't think that a lot of people realize the Caribbean culture in, in Panama and the West Indian influences and things like that. So I very like strong. Very, very strong, very strong. Like, I don't bring a group to Panama without taking them to the West Indian Museum. You know what I mean? And introducing them to Sama. Um, so let me just ask you this, and I, I, I'm going to get ready to wrap up, but I want to leave us, I want you to leave us with whatever uh, information you want us to have, and I will put in the description um, from the video, uh, when, I, when, I, um, when I post the video, some contact information and everything like that. But say, for example, you have um, Americans or uh, people coming from other country, expats. Um, particularly in my case, I focus on American, uh, U.S. expats. We're all Americans. Um, what what kind of volunteers do you need? You know, what are the what are the kinds of skill sets that would be really beneficial to the Shabaka and also to um, the planning and the work that hopefully will be getting done in Cologne. Um, um. The, the plan has different components. So we have a, cap a capacity building component that's, that's so we did, sh we put Shabaka together. There is a technical component for technology and we call it exchange of technology. So we did, we put together Emotech, uh, the Emotech Center for Technology Exchange. There's also the issue of peer trade. So now we are working on a uh, 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 agricultural product commodity center. And Hugh that just was on the, was uh, in the room, he's one of the coordinators. He's from Jamaica. He's one of the coordinators of the commodity exchange program. So there are different components. So we need people that have financial background, uh, people that have a community service experience, um, people that have social workers, uh, people who are very much into technology that can do web paging and, and training. Each one of the components now uh, is going to need or require people who can come in and say, okay, I have 10 years of experience. I'm an architect. Um, let's see what part of the, of the plan uh, call for building. Let's uh, evaluate the buildings in this particular area, for example, and let's see how which is the best material and what's the best uh, concept that we can uh, implement. Because the process, the good thing about the process is, is that the process allows you to adjust to different communities. Why I'm saying this? Because when you have a plan that is structured in such a way that it's not flexible, you can find yourself that you go to a community and the plan does not fit. So you need to have a process that is flexible enough that it has the concept, but that you can apply the principles of the plan and the process to a particular community and make the adjustments to that particular community because you may have a community with a lot of people who have basic skills, but you may have a next community where the, the skills of the people are very limited. You need to work and build in your skills to the point where they can participate. So there are people who have skills, but they don't have the opportunity. Yes. Because of, of discrimination, because of uh, lack of development to absorb your skills. But there are other people that they want to participate, but they don't have the skills. So yes. our process 
is flexible enough that it has principles that is adaptable to whatever specific condition that a community may have. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a problem of making adjustment because the process is adjustable. So one of the things that, you know, my passion, even in the United States, I am a natural hair of stylist or basically um, I'm a sister locks consultant in particular. And one of the things that I um, deal with is customer service, customer service and business development. And um, when it comes to um, um, black hair salons, in the United States, we have, and, and, and in other places, and in Panama as well, we have the skills, you know, to do, a, 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 we do really good hair and really bad business sometimes. So what I do is um, I have evolved into coaching. So I coach uh, people coming into the natural hair business and either in some small black businesses too, to do excellent business because that's my thing. And that is one of my contributions to Panama. You know, uh, I am a Sister Locks consultant. It's a trademark, um, you know, hair system. Um, but what I'm doing is when I come, when I, when I come to Panama, what I see is that unless we take a uh, customer service and presentation up in Panama, foreigners are going to come and put everybody out of business. So what I want to do is I want, I want to work with natural hairstylists, um, black natural hairstylists in Panama and do business development with them. Business development, customer service training, Orena and I have talked about it now for like over a year and the pandemic kind of put a wedge in between some of the things that we are doing. So when it comes, my, the thing that keeps me from doing a lot is my Spanish is just so bad. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is, my husband says I'm much better than I used to be, but I'm not confident at all. Um, I continue to try and I'm going to, I'm going to get better. I declare that I'm going to get better, but until I am completely bilingual, there are some people who I'm going to miss, you know, being able to help just because of the, the barrier. So when you have opportunities and I can express and share in English, you know, I am all open for that. That is what my contribution, my personal, one of my personal contributions to Panama is that the sisters that have black hair businesses will be able to compete with foreigners who come in that have better experience and training uh, with regard to business management and customer service. Because other than that, they're gonna get run out of business. Yeah. What, what, what I notice is that there are a lot of young people that, that do very good work. Uh, we did a workshop with, uh, with hairstyles and rap and things like that. And there, yes. were, there were two sisters that they were brilliant, um, but they, they don't have like, you've just mentioned training in terms of like, if you tell them, well, are you, in the near future planning to open a shop, they will tell you no, that they don't have that type of vision because they yes. don't have that type of uh, uh, preparation. So mm -hmm. Shabaka, one of the things that we want to do is set up a system whereby somebody can come in zero and in X amount of time uh, receive the kind of training that will allow them to take what they do very well yes. to the next level. Yes. Now, um, there are people who they have ideas, but they, they haven't developed the skills to make those ideas feasible. Um, so the, what we want to do at some point is have a, a different programs, mm -hmm. programs for people who have ideas, but they don't have any specific skills, they just have an idea. Uh, people who want the opportunity to participate as workers. So the people who want to open a business, they, we can say, well, we have a list of people that, are, that are, we have trained in this particular area and that you can use their services and they, they just want to work. 
Yes. Now, now there are other people who have been for five, six, seven, eight years, been uh, do, here styling in people's homes. And like well, that's what I see a lot. Yes. They go from home to home and whatever, but they but they don't they don't pay social security. If they get sick, it's a problem. If they need an operation, it's a problem because they haven't gone into the system. So yes. as they get older, they start having problems yes. because they don't have a retirement. They, they, they haven't have contributed to retirement fund. Um, if they if they need a, a car or, or they need to buy a home, no they don't have any reference. Mm -mm. So they, they will not be able to get like a, like a mortgage. So that's the kind of problem that we have. We have the same problem, Melvin. Yeah. We have the same problem in the United States. And that is why, um, you know, and then you get old and you don't have anything in Social Security. And it's like, it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's cute while you're making money and not giving nobody none, not paying no taxes or anything like that. But when you can't work, right. you know, or when you get too old and you have nothing coming in, that is when it becomes a problem. So even educating, you know, us, and I say us, meaning, you know, people from Blacks from the U.S. and in Panama the same way, you know, that is kind of my, my passion. And then, you know, I used to be a mortgage broker and I had a, a waitress come in one day and she, you know, we talked about her buying a house and this girl was making a lot of money, okay? And then, so I'm like, good. She told me how much she was making. I pre-qualified her. And then I said, okay, let me see your taxes. When it came time to see her taxes, she didn't have any money. You know, she had not declared any of the money she had made. All those tips that she made, she didn't declare it. And so I said to her, well, where's all the money? And she had a book that she actually kept track of her tips every day so that she could tell you, I made this much money. I said, it doesn't work that way. You can't have it both ways. You can't tell the government I haven't made any money so that you get a tax return and then tell the government, well, yeah, I did make this money so that you can buy a house. It doesn't work both ways. So just trying to get that out there. So I am so excited. You know, I didn't know how excited I was to meet you, but we really, really have to get together because um, some of the things that you're talking about, you know, I'm working with a group of people um, right now and we're really um, serious about making a difference in the place that, that we are. There's so much that we can give to each other. And um, that's, that's what I'm about. And so, I, like I said, I feel like Panama has a lot to give and uh, we just cannot be takers. You know what I'm saying? It has a lot to give. Panama has been a blessing to me. And I've not come to Panama just to take from mm -hmm. it. So I'm always trying to figure out how to give back. Um, this was a wonderful um, interview. And I don't know if we actually said what SOAD means. So let's make sure that we everybody knows that SOAD is the state of African diaspora. Diaspora, that's correct. Diaspora. Uh, that's yes. Yeah. State of the African diaspora. Okay, because I'm going to put the uh, website and information um, there too. I want to thank you for your community service. I'd like to uh, point out to everybody that your food bank has fed over 2,700 people in the last 26 weeks. That's correct. And now we have grown to we have grown to 35 weeks, and we have uh, service. 5,316 persons. Wow. That is awesome. And that right there, you know, a community a organization that's reaching out and helping others because times are, you know, a lot of people, I say when it comes to this pandemic, that we might be all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And there are some people that, you know, they're riding out this storm hungry. You know what I'm saying? There are some of us who we're inconvenienced. I mean, I can't fly like I used to. I can't get together with my family, you know, like I want to. But there are people who are actually hungry. 
Right. Um, so, and uh, that's another thing. Hunger is definitely a passion of mine as well. So I just want to say thank you and, um, and best wishes to you with the upcoming election on December 1st. Um, SOAD is blessed to have people like you and Orena Best, who is, is my queen, baby. I just love her. And I also want to give a quick shout out to Celia Turner. She is that quiet little person that puts, well, she ain't quiet. But <laughs> she put people she, together. She, she is amazing. She is. She really amazing. is. She really is. And we she really is. love her. We, we love her. We appreciate the work that she does. Her energy, her style. Yes. She is a blessing to us. She is. She really is. And she has connected me with so many wonderful people, including yourself, including um, Arena, including, uh, including Dr. Harris Burroughs. And um, so I just want to thank you. And um, you want me to we'll put your contact information down. And we'll look forward to connecting with mm -hmm. you when sure. we get to Panama. I'll be there in January. So hopefully we can connect then. Sure. Then maybe I can have you come back and talk to our group of 60. We're having two groups of 30 um, okay. in May. And you can talk to us uh, in person about the things that you're doing. So I appreciate sure. you coming on. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to try this thing that we said. So yes, I'm going. I'm, I'm going to try to uh, try. leave let the me meeting here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You see it? Y'all bear bear with me. Y'all know I'm not that technology savvy. Leave. Okay. Okay. Ciao. 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 Ah, we did it. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. So listen, because before I could never figure out how to let people off the hook, well, I have a minute to talk to y'all, okay? So I just want to say, you know, thank you to everybody um, for uh, supporting Black expats in Panama. I am so excited and charged up after talking to uh, Mr. Melvin Brown, um, he is just a wealth of information and somebody who we definitely want to connect to once we get um, to Panama. I'm excited about the upcoming plans for Cologne. Um, and it's, you know, we're, we're at a place now where Cologne just needs to stop being a dirty word and we can be a part of making that, that happen. How cool is that? I mean, like totally, how cool would that be to be making a difference somewhere, making a difference where we go, you know, helping people, sharing our skills. Um, as he said, he needs technological people. He needs social workers. Um, you know, architects. And so we're, when we go to Panama, we're going to introduce uh, you to uh, Mr. Brown and see if we can connect. Um, Panama is just an amazing place to be. I thank you guys for um, listening. I thank you for all of the wonderful comments and support that you give um, to these long behind videos. God help me. And I want to say that I think we have nine spots left. For our second trip, the first one sold out, May 1st to May 5th is sold out, but we have another one, May 28th through June 1st. Um, and so that right there, so we do we do have about nine, I think, um, spots left for that one. And uh, if you wanna if you wanna come, check us out on um, Black Expats in Panama um, Facebook group. And I think that's about it. I hope everybody had a great holiday. And I will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Charlotte Van Horn, Black Expats in Panama, baby. Signing off. Thank you. <laughs>